Hey fam, Jay from Push Black here with a special bonus episode of Black History Year. So we had planned to do six episodes this spring, then come back for 12 more this fall. But an opportunity came our way that we just had to bring to y'all. Up next, a conversation on black motherhood with Gabrielle Union and Carrie Washington. So turn off the notifications on your phone. You might want to save this one for a walk. Whatever you got to do, because this goes deep. These women have things you need to hear and that you won't hear anywhere else. Carrie Washington is an actress, producer, and director known for her roles in Ray, Django Unchained, Scandal, and the Emmy-nominated American Son. For years, Washington was known as an extremely private person who didn't really discuss her family life. Lately, though, she's talking more about what motherhood means to her. Washington is the mother of three, she calls them littles, with actor, producer, and former NFL star Namdi Asamoa. Gabrielle Union is an actress, activist, and author. You may know her from her starring roles in Deliver Us From Eva, Think Like a Man, and Being Mary Jane. She's married to the retired NBA star Dwayne Wade and is the stepmother to three kids from Wade's previous relationships. They've also raised Wade's nephew for the past 12 years. Union and Wade had their daughter, Kavya, in 2018 via surrogacy after many years struggling with fertility issues and miscarriages. In this conversation, you'll hear Union refer to her stepdaughter, Zaya, who has undergone a gender transition and is now using she, her pronouns. The wisdom, humility, humor, and black pride that both mothers bring is inspiring. Enjoy, and thanks for joining us for another episode of Push Black's Black History Year podcast. Let's get to it. We start every interview with some similar questions. So, and this is for both of y'all to answer. What does Black liberation look like to you? Carrie? It's such a good question for us because I feel like our job is to utilize our imagination. And I've been feeling like we've been telling a lot of story about who we are and who we've been. And that's really important that we acknowledge the complexity of our experience. But I want to start to do some more imagining and creating narratives around what liberation looks like. Because I think in the same way that audiences seeing a Black president on 24 made it more palatable once Barack Obama came around, we have the capacity to lay the groundwork in people's neural pathways for like, this is what it could be for Black people. So that's not just me stalling. That's really me saying like, what a poignant and important thing for us to be considering. Do you have an answer, Gab? Thank you for giving me a little time. Yeah. I was like, mm. but being on this journey with Zaya really made me unlearn a lot of things and re-examine a lot of my ideas because I would have had a different idea of what Black liberation looked like a year ago. And mm. being on this journey and understanding that there is no Black liberation if we do not center the most marginalized of us and cover the most marginalized of us. So for me, Black liberation is just being able to exist as you are, mm -hmm. being able to self-identify in peace, being able to live, love, prosper, or fail in peace, and to still feel loved and protected and honored, and that there is a space and a place for each one of us. A year ago, I probably would have said something that have, had to do with Black capitalism. But seeing how high the stakes are in my own household and seeing how so many people really just want us to abandon that Black liberation for one of our children is wild and not on the table. So my definition of Black liberation changed dramatically. Yeah. And my next question was going to be, what does Black liberation for Black mothers look like for you? And I think you touched on some of that. Do you all have something different to say specifically for liberation for Black mothers? I love, Gab, what you said about just being. The idea that we could just be and experience our Blackness with joy and not as burden. As it relates to motherhood, it's like that for us and that for our kids, our families. Gabrielle, what do you think? I mean, Black liberation for mothers, are we starting at the freedom to not politicize our appropriation, the freedom to have proper health care while we're delivering all throughout the pregnancy. How about, how about even before that? How about, how about reproductive rights? Like 
do I have the right to family plan? Can I plan my family by having control of my uterus rather than have those determinations be made by the state so that I can enter into motherhood at a time that is filled with my own sense of identity and goal and vision for my life. I mean, you look at Serena Williams, you know, Mm -hmm. all of the access and resources and privilege and and all of it. And none of it helped her when her back was against the wall and, and she almost died during childbirth. So it's like Black liberation as mothers is the freedom to have access the freedom Mm. to to bring life into this world and it not cost our life. Mm. The freedom to parent how we see fit without being demonized. Oof. And judged. And Mm -hmm. and just, yeah. Trying to to mother in the best way that you know how and and Mm. having the freedom to do that. Mm -hmm. Motherhood scares that bejesus out of me. I, I live in fear of getting it terribly, terribly wrong. And I, I mean, but that comes from being judged harshly every step of the way. That's right. For sure. Right. So I've, I've heard you mention this before as far as your, your fear going into being a mother and then during it, I'm sure there's still some fears after. So speak a little more about what you were afraid of and how that's transformed over time. Like I, I talk a lot about like fearing that motherhood had rejected me. And so when I finally became a mother to Claudia James via surrogacy, just this fear of maybe it was natural selection and I'm not supposed to be doing this. And mm. anything that I was doing was going to be the wrong thing because I actually wasn't supposed to be a mother because it had it had rejected me. So trying to overcome those fears of you're doing everything wrong because this part of life has given you the stiff arm. It makes you second, third, fourth guess everything you do. You know, and and a lot of that just in this last year with Zaya making me unlearn a lot of the ideas I have about what it is Mm. to be a woman in this world and, and how you need to perform femininity and what that has to look like. And just trying not to to put some of the more oppressive, misogynistic <laughs> traditions, uh, you know, and, and, and cultural norms on these girls that I'm raising. But it's hard when you, you feel like every step is, is just a massive failure that can lead to catastrophic results for these kids. What are your thoughts on that, Carrie? You know, embedded in the idea of Black motherhood is fear. It's woven into our DNA. And I was thinking about it because When I got pregnant on Scandal, I begged Shonda Rhimes to make Olivia Pope pregnant because I was like, how am I going to hide this human being? Like, I can't even do the Olivia Pope walk with this person growing inside me. And Shonda refused. She was like, nope, not Olivia Pope. She's not having kids. And I really didn't unpack that until I was in rehearsals for American Son. And I started thinking about this idea that, you know, Olivia Pope was kind of a superhero. She was supposed to not have any vulnerabilities except for fits. And so we couldn't make Olivia Pope a mother of a Black child because that would make her a more vulnerable human being. And we couldn't allow that to happen to her character. Like that vulnerability is just synonymous with parenting Black children. That's real. Yeah. So mothers are often caught on to be leaders in creating and holding the space for vulnerability and emotional safety. So how do you all approach that at home? So this really is like a shout out to therapy. I have realized that a lot of the way that I deal with vulnerability is based on what I witnessed in my mother. And so I've also had to really look at what are the things that I want to carry forward. I have, an, I have a phenomenal mother who I respect immensely, but also what are some of the things that I might want to do differently and how can I really examine that and, and unpack it and be willing to have the courage to try things differently and, and have it be okay to fail, whatever that means, but just to be like experimental and authentic about who I am as a mother and not just take on these generational burdens of, of how we interact. I think that's been really important for me. I, I was thinking, Gab, how amazing it is actually that in the moment where you're talking about navigating doing things your way with your little 
that Zaya is giving you the courage by forcing you to unlearn how to, you know what I mean? It's like they, mm-hmm. they, they, these kids, like, I think they come in at the exact time they're supposed to come to teach you exactly what you need to learn. And so often we operate from an idea of like, our job as adults is to make them better. I think part of what, what I try to remember is I'm the one who's supposed to be better. I have to get better to meet their needs. They don't have to get better to meet my needs. I have to get better to be able to serve who they are unfolding as in the world. What do you think, Gabrielle? You know, our parents' generation, a lot of it is, even with our the best parents, was kind of like a one-size-fits-all. And you have to hope mm. that you have, you know, however many kids you have, it all works for those kids. Yeah. And my little sister uh, lives with us now and helps with with Kav. And seeing how much we do that is exactly like my mom and how it doesn't always work with each kid. Like we have, you know, different kids who have different needs and you could say, you know, do the same thing for, for Zaya and it'll work with Zaire. And Kav is like, if you don't get out of here with that mess and watching my (laughs) mom, you know, my mom at 60 adopted the first of her three kids. So now she's 73 and she's got two teens and a, and a preteen. And she's trying to wow. use, you know, the tricks from the 80s. And I'm like, oh, mom, n- no, um, that doesn't work anymore. These newfangled kids are just totally different. And you're going to have to reach each one where they're at. But trying mm-hmm. to, to figure out what you can keep and what you can throw away for each kid is like a daily journey. Some days mm-hmm. I'm like, I need Google Maps because I've, <laughs> I've lost my way. So, Gabrielle, how do you navigate that with your mothers and the way that they've done things and how you want to exist as a mother now? I know my wife has expressed a sort of a conflict with that being raised in the South. So how do you all navigate that and trying to communicate with your mothers? Like, OK, how I'm doing things is going to be a little different, but you got to trust me. I think my dad has a different idea of discipline and how mm-hmm. children are supposed to exist but like also be mute and like invisible (laughs) unless of course we have called upon them to perform dances or tricks or you know recite things um and and my mom is very like a little bit more hippie and I'm somewhere kind of in the in the middle and when my, my my parents are divorced so when my dad comes to visit it just feels like chaos and he's Ooh. like they're everywhere and I'm like yeah they were here um, and, and my mom and my mom is like oh they're so quiet I'm like yeah they're reading like just sort of making peace with my relationship as their children at the same time I'm making peace with motherhood and parenting in this generation uh for these kids where they're at and being okay with like I know that worked for you it doesn't work for me still love you though For sure. Carrie, what about you? Yeah, I think the same. I mean, I think the sense of humor about it is really important because, you know, it just keeps everybody more relaxed. What I hear when Gab says, like, love you, though, is a confidence in our own choices. And so, you know, not to sound too woo-woo, but I have to be willing to parent myself. Like, I can't be out here parenting my kids seeking my mother's approval, right? Like that's not, that's not going to work. I have to parent my kids from my own internal GPS. And if I'm making choices to try to appease her, then that's not good for my family. You know, I'm not building relationship. Now there, then again, I remember like when my oldest little (laughs) was born, my mom helped me a lot. She came out to LA and she was with me for a while. And I was like stiff up her lip, like driving her to the airport when she was leaving, you know, feeling really good. And she turned to me and said, you're a really good mom. And I lost it. Like, <gasps> like the ugly cry, like, because, you know, you do, I do try to make choices out of my own instincts, but it still means a lot when your own mother values your parenting. So to, to the grandmothers out there who might be listening, I would invite you to just celebrate your daughters or your daughter-in-laws. Um, you might want to nitpick and control and talk about all the things they can be doing better, but just letting them know where they're doing great will really serve your relationship. So I 
was reading Patricia Hill Collins and she talks about the role of other mothers in the role of mm-hmm. in the life of black children. You know, these are the women that are in a black child's life that are necessarily the blood mothers or the direct mothers, but they serve in a mothering capacity. Now, this is something that's been integral to black families since, you know, from West Africa to our time in America. Tell me about you all's other mothers. Who were they? What was it like? The village is so big. Yeah. I come from the biggest Black family in the state of Nebraska, which is probably not that hard to be. But For real? Um, you, <laughs> but really, you are officially the biggest Black family? Oh, yeah. The second Sunday of every August, we have our annual family reunion, and we are at 100, our 103rd family reunion this upcoming August. Wow. Very curious how we're going to do a socially distanced uh, family reunion. But it's literally, you know, thousands of people descend on the park in, in Omaha. Everyone flies in. Every faction of the family, every branch of the family has their own t-shirt. It's like t-shirt wars where you represent your side <laughs> of the family. Yes. Yeah, so it's my, my aunts and cousins, older siblings, my mom's best friends, my older sister's best friends. And at different points in my teen years, my best friend's parents, mothers. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, everyone kind of just tagged each other. And and I know that they all spoke like my mom and different other women in, in, you know, that were in my orbit. I know they spoke because they all seemed to be on the sort of same page, but delivered the message a little differently. But they all worked together. There was no competition, which you can see sometimes when there's villages and you, you know, you might be closer to one person than another or closer to different people outside of your parents at different times. And for some folks that can be points of conflict and tension, but I was just very lucky to have such a big old group of different kinds of women be a part of making me who I am and keeping me on the right path. I mean, and, and that's just spread, you know, my older sister is done mother to so many kids. Every time I go visit her, I'm like, now who all lives here? Um, <laughs> It appears to be about 15, but it's, we, that's just how we were raised. You tag in, you know, when you see a kid in need, you tag in and it, it kind of made my transition into being a stepmother a lot more seamless because it's just who I am and where I come from. Carrie, what about your experience? Very, very similar. My mom is one of seven, but it was five girls and two boys. Um, same, same. No. Both sides. Both sides. Wow. Yeah. One so, seven, so five girls, two boys. Yeah, so a lot, a lot of auntie mommies, um, a lot of other mothers, a lot of eyes watching you. <laughs> um, and also, my mom was in like a women's group when she was pregnant with me, and those women stayed together. And so we had like a, it was like a child care co-op, you know, where like we all, this group of cousins and friends who either lived in my building in the Bronx or their moms worked with my mom, whatever it was, it was a collection of moms and kids. And we all went to gymnastics on Monday and the same two moms drove that day. And we all went to dance class on Tuesday and we all went to, you know, and so they like rotated around whose work schedule I'm teaching at this time. So I'll pick up, you drop off. We had these schedules and this circle of moms. And what I love about it was you did get the idea that there were lots of ways to be a mom and that not everybody's mom was the same and that you could, like Gab say, gravitate toward one kind of mother or another and that that was okay like because it was all your village. It wasn't as threatening. And, and I think that's like that was one of the things that really drew me to Little Fires as a project was this idea that Like sometimes a daughter can find her mother in another home and how that can feel so threatening to a mom who you feel like you're losing your child because we have these ideas that your your daughter is somehow your mini me as opposed to your daughter is her own human on her own journey who's allowed to find inspiration and comfort in other people. So I think that's a, a really healthy idea. It's something that we got from other mothers and I don't know, I don't see as much of that in my world right now, but that just might mean, that just might be my world. (laughs) Before I forget, I want to give a shout out to this really beautiful children's book called Maasai and Me. And it's about a little girl who learns about Maasai warriors, Maasai village. And and you made me think of it because one of the pages is she's, she's on the floor of her apartment building, but she opens in the illustration, she opens the door to her apartment building and it's a Maasai village. And she talks about how she only knows two people on her floor in her building. But if she was Maasai 
everybody in the village would be part of her family and her community. We've just yeah. been like nonstop African culture in the circle time. In, in COVID, I'm like, oh, I'm in control of what you're reading. <laughs> it's nonstop <laughs> blackness. <Amazing. laughs> um, so I, and I just discovered that one, Maasai and me. It's an interesting idea of being sort of disconnected, but knowing that we would have a village in another context. So Mm -hmm. how do you all keep your children connected to a village or just the greater Black community since you do exist in spaces where there's often more white folks than Black folks? How do you all navigate that? Gabrielle? For us, we've we've had to find our own, create our own little village, whether that be through sports or through the arts or through our neighbors, finding like-minded Black folks who also need more access to us and more access to community. But it's, I mean, it takes work. You have to want to do that. (laughs) And you you have to, there has to be a, a large element of trust. It's been a slow process, especially since Kav has been born. And with Zaya, we've had to go all out our comfort zone and to try to find other families of literally any race who have kids who are going through the same sort of transitions and and pooling resources and exchanging information about therapists and and schools and all the other resources that you kind of need to raise happy, healthy, well-adjusted children in the LGBTQ plus community. So that's been a little bit more of a challenge and we had to kind of open it up beyond just Black folks because there's not a ton of uh, Black folks who've, who've made peace with their core children at this age. So in, in just the search of community, we've had to sort of open that up. And, and hopefully along the way, I think we've inspired a couple more families to, um, to join the village and, and find that, that peace and acceptance in their, in their household. You definitely have, Gab. You can see it all the time on social media. Like you just, the, the way that you are parenting is it's really allowing young people to feel like they can be who they are and their parents to feel like they don't have to navigate it alone. So powerful. You know, there is this sort of mythical ideal of leisure motherhood in this country, you know, uh, stay at home mom, dad just goes out, brings the money home. But historically, Black women have had to work outside the house while raising a family. And you both are fortunate to be in careers that you love and are passionate about, but I know that they are extremely demanding careers. So how does it feel trying to balance the demands of career with the demands of home? Carrie? It's hard. (laughs) I think it's hard for any working parent. And I do, like, I really want to challenge journalists, especially to just ask more dads about their work-life balance. Because I think it's a very real thing. Like a lot more men in our generation are balancing fatherhood with their work. Like it's important to them to be present in their children's lives. And we do a disservice by not asking men about their work-life balance. And I'm not saying they have it as the same as us. There, there are differences, of course. But I think we need to address that both parents are outside the home and inside the home. And I just, I really try not to go down that guilt spiral. (laughs) Like that's the biggest thing is I really try not to beat myself up for not being everywhere all the time perfectly. I don't know where that expectation even planted a seed in my brain, but it's not healthy. You know, like I don't want to be at home obsessing about work or at work obsessing about home. I try to do this, to think strategically about my time ahead of time, to schedule my week proactively so that I'm spend, I know that I'm spending time in the places that are meaningful to me. And then when I'm there, just be there and not, and try not to be like, oh, I wish I was, but it's hard. It's hard because I really, I love what I do for work and I love being a mother. So it, it, it is hard. Oh, for sure. And, you know, as a working father, I'm glad you shouted me. I've been waiting on somebody to do that. So thank you. It's hard. I agree. I know what you mean. Gabrielle, you have anything to add on to that? Carrie, thank you for mentioning that. Because that became like my refrain a couple years ago around the time Cobb was born. I was getting the question a lot on a on a press tour. And I said, yeah, it, it's really wild to me that my husband's like literally never been asked that. And he got full custody of his kids since, what, 2020? 20, 10, 2012, he got a a toddler, uh, an eight-year-old, and then took custody of another eight-year-old. 
And there was never the question about how do you balance it all as a full-time star athlete. And I realized there isn't an expectation of balance for men. The, the expectation is, did the check clear? And provided you are providing, that's enough. Anything else is like a bonus. And so I started calling people to the carpet about like, do you ask men the same question about balance? Because now it feels like an un reasonable expectation that we put on women to somehow yep. do all of these things and, and juggle all these balls when we are contributing to the household as well, financially, spiritually, emotionally, that, that we don't expect of men. And so I was like, I rebuke you and I rebuke that question. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and, I, and, I, and, and then even to answer that, honestly, is there is no balance. The balance is a lack of balance and being okay with a lack of balance. If I'm hitting it out of the park at work and I'm, and I'm, I'm having to burn the midnight oil and I'm giving 110%, I'm actually now at a deficit. There's just, there's no more percentage points. And if I'm giving, you know, 50% at home, that's still an F. Mm. So I had to let that thing go a while ago because I just didn't have any. And I was starting to feel crazy. And I'm like, I'm not crazy. I'm a normal human being. And, I, and I'm going to stop putting that on myself and stop putting that on anyone else. So let's see. Let's talk about some of y'all's Y'all works. Y'all got me sweating up in here. <laughs> My <laughs> battle. <laughs> let's see. Carrie, American Son, congratulations and congratulations. They, they, let, they let us success. in the building this year. This year. Yeah. Of course, because there is no building. They let us in the building. Because there won't be an actual ceremony. So right. like, this is the year yeah. we can get on the black folks because they won't actually come. So your character does have to face the worst fear as a Black parent. What type of fears do you all have raising kids in this era where there is social unrest? So funny. I saw Gab talking about it, I think in an interview with Oprah. And I, I don't think I'd ever seen anybody talk about it so honestly. And I was like, you know, standing ovation in my living room. <laughs> and um, and so when we were, when I was looking for producers for American Son, she was one of my first phone calls because I was like, I want to send this project to women who know Kendra in their bones because I want us to be telling the story. I don't want to be accountable to a bunch of people who, who are going to try to tell me what Kendra's worldview is. I want to make this with my sisters. So I went to Gab and to Jada and to Shonda, Black moms who have children who know that deep fear. You know, every mother, I think every mother, once that child, if if your path into parenthood is your body, I always say like, once that kid was out of my body, it was like, I had no control. The lack of control might start earlier with other pathways to motherhood. But like literally when my kids were in me was the only time I could decide what they eat and what they hear and, <laughs> you know, and then you're, it's just a big experiment in letting go. And I think that's true for all mothers, but I think to the ways that that's complicated when there are systems in place that are built to demonize your child, when the systems of oppression for your child are so institutionalized, woven into the fabric of what is supposed to be safety for your kid, the fear just gets turned up to a 10. So Gabrielle, breaking in, you played a mother that had to protect her kids from home intruders. What does being a protector look like for you in real life? Ooh, daily advocating for my kids. I, I like to start off every school year doing the big mama walk up to the school. I'm a firm believer and you, you got to start the school year off right with a little bit of fear that I will be present. I will be coming up here. Any old thing is not, is not going to fly with my kids. And I, I have to be their best advocate and, and instill in them to be their own best advocate. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's daily with us, with all the, the different things going on with the different kids. Being their most fierce protector and warrior mother, usually at school and usually surrounding issues of discipline and treatment. I found that for our family, there has been an, a little extra motivation to sort of squash our kids' spirit. The notion of the uppity Negro and putting us in our place, even though they're matching everyone else, because there's this notion that our children are somehow think their, their poop doesn't smell. And it's like, they're, they're actually acting like everyone else. Why are you so focused on squashing the spirit of, of my children? And I'm going to be here as often as I need to be to make sure that their, their soul and their spirit is, is allowed to soar like every other child for this tuition, as long as my check clears. Um, <laughs> Got to make sure you, you treat my kids right. But it's, it's daily, you know, it's daily. People come for you. Yeah, you know that phrase, you tried it. They try it. 
<laughs> and I found that we talk about the respectability politics and, and how it can be like fool's gold. And this idea that if you just speak a certain way and live a certain way and you just accomplish your way out of, out of racism and, and discrimination, there is a blowback for making it. There are people who, who get very upset at Black success. There is a, almost a visceral reaction to Black excellence that we don't talk about enough. And, and this notion of the uppity Negro needing to be put down. I've heard you guys talking about you know, fears and, and, and for your kids. Our kids know their rights. And my fear is, so did Sandra Bland. And we see how that ended. There's something about an empowered, knowledgeable Black person, children and adult, that a lot of people find inherently threatening. You know, you've said before that you want your children to understand the importance of inner beauty over outer beauty. But mm. the world that you exist in in Hollywood is obviously, uh, you know, beauty and youth are overemphasized for women and Black women in particular. And we live in a world where white standards of beauty are put on a pedestal over Black standards of beauty. So how do you instill in your kids a uh, positive self-image? So much of parenting I'm learning is not it's really about me doing the work on myself because, you know, with kids, it's not about what you say. It's really about what you do. And so it's really like, do I look in the mirror and like what I see? Do I model the behavior of liking the face that I wake up with in the morning as much as the face that I put on when I go to work? I started wearing my hair natural more when I had my six-year-old because she has curly hair and I wanted, I didn't want her to only see me with my Olivia Pope blowout. You know, I wanted to make sure that I'm loving myself fully as a black woman when I look in the mirror. And, and I think that's what kids really see. They witness our relationship with our own blackness. So it's important for me to like, live in the world feeling beautiful, like to do the work so that I feel beautiful in my house because that's what they absorb. That's what they witness. That's part of why taking care of ourselves as Black mothers is so important. Why like self-care is not just like a frilly thing for white women, right? Like we must take care of ourselves and find ways to cultivate a sense of health and wellness and beauty because that's how we model to our kids that our our black lives matter not just the black lives in the street but that we value our own lives we make choices for the the rich fulfillment of our own lives as human beings well hey i really appreciate you all's time um, i know you got stuff to do so thank you for taking time out of your schedules to talk to us so i'm gonna let y'all go but is there any final words of encouragement you want to give to any black mothers listening right now because i know you love to put stuff in a historical context i just think i don't want to be dark but I, I i really often think when we express our love and connection like when we allow ourselves to be deeply connected to our children it is how we heal the decades, the centuries of having our children ripped from our arms. That phrase that we use so casually, oh, she sold you down the river, was because our children were taken from us and sold down river. And so prioritizing like love, like deep, intimate love and connection with our kids is so important. It's so important that we don't hold our kids at arm's length or that we don't worry about having feelings for our kids and with our kids and, and making space for their feelings because the desire to not feel vulnerable with each other comes from the trauma of not being able to be family. And so the more that we can be family, the more that we can heal that wound. Thank you. That's great. Gabrielle? Don't be afraid to, to share your failures. Be transparent mm. about your mistakes. Uh, it's, a bar, it's a part of what Carrie was talking about, that deeper connection of, of love. A lot of that comes from honesty and transparency of, of your journey. You don't have to be perfect to be a great parent. Part of that journey towards perfection is be a perfect communicator. <laughs> you know, strive mm. for, um, for complete transparency of your journey and your struggles and your mistakes. 
and, and don't try to hold yourself in a godlike place. Be okay with being okay and showing your kids when you're not okay. All of it makes for deeper, more lasting, more meaningful connections. I love that. Oh, I love that. Carrie, Gabrielle, thank you all so much for joining us on Black History Year. You share so much and you were so open and we really appreciate you all sharing that with our audience. I think everyone's really going to get a whole bunch from this interview. Black History Year is produced by Push Black, the nation's largest nonprofit black media company. Obviously, the power that comes from knowing our history is important to you. Push Black exists because we saw we had to take this into our own hands. You make Push Black happen with your contributions at blackhistoryyear.com. Most people do five or 10 bucks a month, but everything makes a difference. Thanks for supporting the work. Black History Year is produced by Michael L. Sesser and Jessica Rue Franz from Limina House. Edited by Sasha Kai Parker with production support from the Push Black team. Tariq Alani, Brooke Brown, Eskadar Getahoon, Abney Jones, Patrick Sanders, Aquia Tay, Jerea Bradley, and Sydney Smith. <laughs>